And so he, and he became a religious seeker. So, you know, he was a nerd. Joseph Smith was a nerd. So that's our, that's our reframing of Joseph Smith and the that's translation of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith was a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> we'll defend that. Yeah. We'll defend that. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Jonathan Neville and Jim Lucas, co-authors of By Means of the Urim and Thummim, we're going to talk about why they say that Joseph Smith was a nerd. <laughs> Is he just a tech nerd? And were seer stones and Urim and Thummim the technology of the day? So you won't want to miss this conversation. And I guess the final thing I wanted to mention, maybe you were too, is what difference does it make, right? Well, that was exactly where I was I know, going. I know. Because okay. I know we had this conversation. Right. I think it was on the Monday night Book of Mormon meetings, right? Yeah. 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 Book because Mormon I was like, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, I don't care if it was a stone in a hat. I don't care right. if it was the Urim and Thummim. Like, it was a miracle. Who cares how it was done? Right. I don't know if it was loose or tight or whatever. Like, I just have a testimony of the Book of Mormon. Right. And so it seems like, to me... And I know you have your multiple working hypothesis, and yeah. hey, let's kumbaya, everybody get along. But it seems like you, to me, you guys are really putting a lot of emphasis into. No, it was the Yerman Thummim, and it, okay, like to, to me, it's it, like you're, there's there's a big stake in this. There um, is, and I don't. I, let I don't, me let I don't me address feel like that. Like it needs though. to be that. Let way. me answer that, and then Jim can because okay. for me, it's an issue of the credibility of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, right? Because the whole restoration depends on those two only. It's only those two. <laughs> My first thing before we go on there yeah. is because Joseph lied a lot about polygamy. <laughs> well, now so that's when a, you say it's about his credibility. It's like, mm. <laughs> well, okay, polygamy. We could, and I don't want to get off a into different polygamy, topic. but clearly he he. At minimum, if you don't want to say he lied, at minimum he hid the Fanny Alger incident and he hid a lot of the other polygamous wives. Okay. So whether you want to, whether lying is too strong of a word for you, clearly he was deceptive to Emma for sure with regards to polygamy. I, well, let, first off, there's so many gaps in history that when everybody decides what did and didn't happen and what was said and what wasn't said to me is a cloud of, of mystery. Because people don't write down every single thing that happened. Exactly. And people, later on, they remember things the way they want. So we all assume that he misled Emma about Fanny Alger, right? Right. We don't really know what went on between them. And the Saints book is pretty good about that by saying that there's a lot of vague areas in here. And people reach conclusions like this Emma Pilgrim. You know, one phrase in one sentence becomes the gospel truth when it was never intended for that in the first place. And if you've ever been, I've handled a lot of divorce situations as a lawyer, you know, and everybody has two sides. And if you listen to one, they are the gospel truth. If you listen to the other, they are. So all this stuff about polygamy to me is a little bit of a vague. A lot of people have asked me to dig into it, and I've, I haven't. I just don't have <laughs> You're the time. You're smart. <laughs> but, but that's an entirely separate it's situation. It's a can of worms, I'll say that. It's a can of worms. But partly it's a can of worms because of our society, our anti-polygamy bias right. as well. And, and I've worked in a lot of Muslim countries. I've worked with polygamists, you know. And to them, it's no big deal. It's like, why do you guys care about Joseph being polygamous? To us, that's a positive, you know. Yeah. So that's a cultural thing, I think, more than a, a religious thing. But anyway, that's a separate topic. So, but here we're not talking about any uh, vague statements or miscommunication. Joseph Smith, in the Elder's Journal, was asked specific questions. He did a Q&A. And he, they asked, where did the Book of Mormon come from? And he said, well, Moroni is a resurrected being. He came to me, gave me the Urim and Thummim. By means of those, I translated the Book of Mormon. In the Wentworth letter, he did the same thing. And so there's no, no one contradicted him at that time until much later. But all of this was after the um, Mormonism Unveiled came out, which he denounced as full of lies and so on. And so for me, if, if he was had any credibility at all, which I think he did, he and Oliver just reported what happened, then you can't say that those statements of his that were that explicit were false. I mean, if you want to disagree and, and disbelieve the restoration, you can. But if you believe the restoration, how can you reject what Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery said about the Book of Mormon? You know, I, I just, that doesn't make sense to me. People can do it, and I have 
no problem with that if that's what they want to do. But I, I don't think they should do it ignorantly. I think they should confront what Joseph and Oliver said, be aware of what they explicitly said and published, and then intentionally reject it if they want. But don't say it doesn't matter because, you know, I have a testimony anyway, and I don't even want to know what, the, what Joseph well, and Oliver said. Well, there's a lot of people who do it. that. Uh, uh, they do, that, and that's fine. You, people make decisions in ignorance all the time, and mm -hmm. that's fine. That's not an informed decision. And I think that's why so many people are susceptible to what John DeLynn and these others are saying, because DeLynn pretends like he knows the truth, and it's been hidden from the saints. And it hasn't been. Joseph was explicit about it as early, early on in this whole thing and published the answers. The people just have kept them out of the Gospel Topics essays. Except for polygamy. He wasn't, he wasn't publishing a lot about polygamy. <laughs> If you want, we again, polygamy know, is know. another issue. And, and think of it this way Oliver had nothing to do with polygamy either. So I think one of the reasons Oliver and Joseph had the falling out was over polygamy. Absolutely. Right? Okay. So that lends even more credibility to Oliver Cowdery. And he's reaffirming exactly what Joseph said about all this. So when, for, for people who say Joseph used a stone in the hat to translate the entire Book of Mormon we have today, they are saying, like Royal Skousen did, that Joseph and Oliver deliberately misled everybody. If, if that's what people want to believe, I have no problem with that. But to say it doesn't matter to me is, is naive and um, misleading because it leaves members of the church who want to be faithful, who are ignorant of what Joseph and Oliver said. It makes them susceptible to what John DeLynn and these others are saying, which to me is misleading also. Hmm. And that's why it matters. Well, and, and from a... A spiritual philosophical standpoint to me it's one thing to say i translate an ancient text using you know going plate by plate looking at the characters and all that and it's something else to say well these words appeared on a stone and i just read them off or i just got them in my head somehow yeah so to me that's if, if missionaries had come to me and said we got this cool book and it all appeared on a stone and a hat i'd say thank you very much i don't have time i wouldn't be interested I wouldn't have any, even today, if, if, if the Book of Mormon really came from the words on a stone and a hat, had nothing to do with an ancient record, I would really question where the source of it was. And that's why I think it's so important. I, don't, I, I think the reason Joseph and Oliver were so declarative and definitive is because they knew it mattered. Otherwise, they would have said, fine, believe what Mormonism Unveiled says. We, we're not even going to refute it because it doesn't matter. It's still an inspired book. They didn't do that. Just the opposite. So I think it matters as much today as it did in their day. And I think all we have to do is go back to what they said and say we believe what they said, not what these others said. And I would add to that, yeah. not only are Joseph and Oliver the primary witnesses to the Book of Mormon, the translation of the Book of Mormon, but remember, they're also the only witnesses, eyewitnesses, to the restoration of the Aaronic Priesthood and the Melchizedek Priesthood. And the temple blessings. And the temple blessings. So take away the Book of Mormon, the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, and the temple, and, you know, what, what do you have left? <laughs> but those all stand on the testimony of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And David Whitmer refuted all those. Yeah, and so if you take those away, where you end up is David Whitmer. Is David, because that's what David Whitmer, you know, he was an old man, but he was coherent. His book, An Address to All Believers in Christ, is, is a coherent book. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a rant, but, uh, you know, it's clearly, <laughs> you know, the, the sentences follow, and it's a logical presentation. It's, uh, you know, he clearly had his mental faculties about him mm -hmm. when he wrote it. And his argument is, I, I, I accept the Book of Mormon because um, I have this personal witness that I accept the Book of Mormon, but Everything else that all of the Latter-day Saintites have come up with, uh, all this priesthood and this idea of priesthood restoration and, you know, plural marriage and, and, and he, he actually temple probably didn't focus on temple and stuff, covenants, but all, that. all yeah. that. He rejected it all. He rejected it all. And that is the logical conclusion of his position. And so that's where you are. If he's the one you're going to follow, then follow him. And, you know, basically what you have is um, a Protestant church with the Book of Mormon. 
you don't have priesthood, you don't have temples, you don't have any kind of church organization, you don't have a doctrine and covenants. I mean, that that's the logical conclusion of saying uh, Oliver. We, it doesn't matter whether Oliver and Joseph were telling the truth. Yeah. You know, one one of the most controversial blogs I ever posted was when I I put the Mormonism unveiled and and addressed to all believers in Christ on the cover of the Enzyme. <laughs> because I said, well, if you're going to quote from these sources, how can you take one paragraph out of it without leading people to read the entire thing? Let's just publish them both in the Enzyme. And, and boy, I heard from general authorities even about that. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but I said, well, come on, guys. Well, think it's all about copyright, it. right? You can't be well, using the Ensign cover for you. Yeah. Well, I, I just took the, the Ensign cover and put a mock one. I know, I know. But, <laughs> but you know, seriously, if you're going to take David Whitmer's statement about the translation as if it was in isolation without considering everything else he said in there. And, and definitive. Yeah, yeah, and definitive. And you have to consider the whole thing. And Mormonism Unveiled articulates the stone and the hat theory exactly the way the guys at the Interpreter and Book of Mormon Central do today. I mean, it's like they're plagiarizing Mormonism unveiled. It's unbelievable. And so, and yet they don't want people to believe all the rest of it. So to me, it's just like, you don't have to be a historian or a lawyer to realize that when you take a little part out of context, you're misleading whoever's reading what you're well, doing. Whenever you talk to a historian, they always say over and over and over and over, you've got to put it in context. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but Garrett Dirtmack doesn't. In that book you're referring to, he doesn't put in context. I, I'm sure he would disagree with you there. Well, I can. he can't because he doesn't have the context in the book. So he might, I mean, I've gone through this before with lots of them, and he just omits stuff that contradicts his story. I'm hoping he answers my email. Yeah, well, and I'd be happy to have a discussion because if I'm wrong, I'd love to know I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And if I've, if I've overlooked any piece of evidence, I'd love to know about it. But... He, he, we can see the Gospel Topics essay, if we only stick to that, we can see that's entirely misleading because it omits what Joseph and Oliver said. In fact, it even says the only thing Joseph Smith said about the translation is by gift and power of God. That's just a false statement. And it omits what he actually did say. So, you know, historians, I'm not going to say who wrote that essay, but certainly we know the main principles who are advocating that point of view. You can say it. John said it. John Dillon says on here. Who well, then, it? go with it? what he said. I can't remember. <laughs> Let's put it this way. The people who had the input on it have published books about it. The Desert Book is published, like the one you just referred to. Garrett? Garrett's. Dirk Mott? So, I don't remember his name on there. The, on the uh, essay? On the translation? Yeah. It, it, oh, you mean anonymous. you're talking about Let's Talk About who, who wrote The, the Gospel Topics essay? essays are anonymous. Well, yeah, but I, well, I know that's the beauty of them. Ugo Perego did the DNA. Yeah, but it's still anonymous. Yeah. But and it was edited. He, I, I mean, he, he was admitted even, that on my podcast. And and <laughs> Paul Reeve did the race essay. He admitted that on my podcast. Uh, Brian Hales did one of the polygamy essays. I think the other two were Kathleen Flake and... Oh, shoot. Who was the other one? Um, I see her name, but I can't say it. But anyway, so we know... Half a dozen of them already. Well, my, here's my answer. It doesn't matter who wrote it. Oh, because No, it really doesn't because <laughs> it reflects the views of the people, Garrett Dirkmatt and well, Michael McCann. And even to, to be fair, yeah. Paul did say, I didn't write the rest. I, I wrote the first draft, but they edited it down yeah. and he doesn't take credit for That's it. That's right. And Ugo <laughs> said the same. They edited his down, yeah. right? So yeah. they're all they're all edited by a committee. Right. And there's usually an Area 70 but or something. But who was the original guy? I don't know. Oh, I'm, not, I'm going to say I don't know. But it doesn't matter, is the point. Because I'll have to go back to John's episode, I guess. It's the philosophy it behind it that matters. What's the editorial agenda of those essays? And the Gospel Topics essay, the editorial agenda is not truth. It's not accuracy. Because if it was, it would include what Joseph and Oliver said in there. The agenda is to respond to John DeLynn's Faith Crisis Report. That was the... the, the um, origin of those essays in the first place, right? And so, and the, the big thing he talks about in there is the stone on the hat. He still talks about it today on his podcast because it's so inimical to the idea that Joseph and Oliver told the truth. And it, it supports his whole theory that church leaders are misleading everybody about church history. 
And it also plays into the whole folk magic origins yeah. narrative yeah. that is very, you know, also very popular, not only with critics, but with the Mike Quinn school of right. church historians. Yeah. So, I mean, so let me just make this point. So our book has an appendix, and, well, several appendices, but from page 237 to page 254 are nothing but quotes from Joseph and Oliver on the translation. None of that stuff except for like, like little ex, uh, out of context excerpts appears in the books that have been written about the stone in the hat and certainly not in the gospel topics essay or the saints book or the saints book just so, it's like it didn't happen and and that feeds into Delin's narrative and that's why we object to that we're not saying because I kept wondering why are you bringing up John Delin so much this is why okay makes well because yeah. he was the origin of the gospel topics yeah. essays well, yeah, and he's the you know current leading proponent of the uh, of the whole. I mean, they have a coherent narrative. Joseph Smith was a treasure digger, superstitious kid. He had a seer stone. He got some attention from his uh, seer stone activities. You don't agree with you don't disagree with any of this so far, right? No. Okay. But then the if the narrative flows into saying. And then he uh, came up with a story about gold plates, and he he started to get more attention. Well, and that's then an anti Mormon thing. That's not. But that. that's but but the point is that narrative flows, and yeah. it then it, you know and then he came up with uh, a book, and he started religion. And he realized, hey, let's let's roll with this one. I'm I'm I could really get, get big off of this. That's the narrative, and the point is is that the stone in the hat is integral to that narrative because it links. The Book of Mormon to the folk magic origins. So the stone of the well, hand is too anti-Mormon narrative for you, basically. Well, yeah, that's how. That's why it's in Mormonism unveiled because it, it yeah. says there's there's no real plates, right? To begin with, right? Which and is Mormonism unveiled said it, they even made the point they didn't use the plates; they used the stone in the hat. And so, what point was it for the three witnesses to say they saw the plates because they weren't used? But you anyway? said they're not quoting anybody when they say that. No, they don't. it's just a, a narrative they're presenting. Okay. So, but uh, the point is to come back to uh, why this is important. It's because this um, uh, the stone in the hat is a piece of the new anti Mormon narrative. Of well, uh, uh, you, it's not new; it's revived. You revived, say. shall we say? Okay, that's revived unveiled, yeah. uh, narrative that goes back to Mormonism unveiled in eighteen thirty four. But it's gotten new vigor as LDS historians have bought into the stone in the hat thing. That has reinvigorated the folk magic, uh, Mormonism unveiled, criticism of Joseph Smith. So you ask the question, why does this matter? Mm -hmm. Well, to faithful Latter-day Saints who have testimonies of the Book of Mormon, those are the people you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I believe in the Book of Mormon. I don't care how it came, where it came from. Well... We're, this is an answer to your question. One is that it goes to the core of the credibility of the two primary witnesses to all the major events of the Restoration. If you take away Joseph and Oliver, you have nothing, all right? You can just, you know, might as well lock up the key, you know, shut down the temples, you know, <laughs> lock up 40 East West Temple, and everybody can keep their 10%. You can bigger tonight, a cutlerite. Well, not a cutlerite. Bigger tonight, community. Yeah, maybe Christ, you'd want to, uh, if you like the Book of Mormon still, out. you'd you'd, yeah. uh, you'd you'd maybe go and check out. All the strings out. got temple stuff too, but. Yeah, so you'd <laughs> check out the Bigger Tonight's, or, or, you know, if you want to have gay marriage Church and stuff like Christ, that, you'd go lot. to the uh, yeah. community of Christ, you know, if you want to to have women priests and gay marriage, you know, because you can get that stuff there. But, of course, they don't really even have much Book of Mormon left except for our, our friends. But, um, okay, but the, to get back to it, the point is if if you're a believer in the Book of Mormon and, you know, a member of the church, it matters because the credibility of Joseph and Oliver, the whole thing stands on them. And two, if you accept the Stone in the Hat narrative, you're basically buying into the major premises of the current anti-Mormon narrative, explanation of, of uh, where the restoration came from, 
which is that it just came out of Joseph Smith's imagination based on the folk magic uh, culture that he grew up in. Let, let me mention one last thing that we talked about early on about Richard Bushman and his book, mm-hmm. because his book kind of predated... He's not a favorite among the firm foundation people. Well, it's... <laughs> you, I was, I've always were, been surprised how much... Were you there when we his, did our they presentation? They take his name in vain all know, the time. I know, but you know how I keep Even arguing. Even you. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. No, I, I, I'm always advocating for Richard uh, in these meetings. I've done that many times at the Firm Foundation things. And afterwards, people come up to me, how could you say something good about Richard? You know, I said, because he's an awesome guy. He's honest. And so, but, so, but when I read Rough Stone Rolling, which was really kind of the genesis of this, it, was, right. it predated even the faith crisis study. Right. And it brought this whole stone in the hat to the forefront. Right. And so my criticism of that book is that he relates a version of events as factual. And so I went through his chapter on the stone in the hat And I said, here's how I would have done it differently. Not changing any of the evidence he cited, but adding evidence that he omitted. And so I have it on my blog. I can give you the link. Because I I just took it line by line and said, here's rough stone rolling. And here's how it would have been written more, um, I would say, objectively, let's say. Not faithfully. Well, not faithfully. I mean, objectively. Because he says, Joseph did this Because most people say he's pretty objective. Well, okay. You can look at my analysis and see which is more objective. Because <laughs> okay. he just omits stuff that, that contradicts that. It's the same problem we have with Dirt Matt, where he just omits stuff that contradicts his theory. And so I, I try to say, instead of saying this happened, I would say so-and-so said this happened. That's an example. Oh, okay. And it, when you do it that way, the whole stone in the hat narrative becomes much less solid and much less credible because... Instead of stating it as a fact, you say what someone said happened. Okay, you see the difference? Mm-hmm. And, and from a lawyer's perspective, that's all the difference in the world. If you say, and we see plenty of examples of that in, in modern society where you can look at the Trump situation, you know, who said what, what's the facts? Well, you, can, you have completely dueling narratives based on the same facts, right? And, and that's what I'm trying to say. Richard only took one version of those facts. And I think he's he's kind of acknowledging that a little more that he could have been a little more um, included additional material of different perspectives, and that's why he gave us a, a blurb on the book. Yeah, say, he did quote. Yeah, got on the back of your because back cover he's seeing that we're we're changing this narrative from Joseph Smith as a a young uh, magic practitioner looking for lost treasure into Joseph Smith as a young man who had a, a fear of death because of his near death experience became a religious seeker, started reading Christian material, including Jonathan Edwards, to, to seek to know God. So that by the time he had the first vision, it wasn't just some farm boy plucked off the farm. It was someone who had been prepared for years to have that experience. And he knew the significance of it. And then he was also prepared to translate the Book of Mormon. There were a few people of his, let's say, generation who could have translated the Book of Mormon the way he did because he was so conversant with Christian, uh, ide- or I guess I'd say idioms or language, Vocabulary, syntax, con- and- even concepts that he could articulate. And he did it to some degree, even as shorthand. Because as I pointed out in the Edwards thing, when you talk about national man as an enemy of God, if you weren't familiar with Jonathan Edwards, that phrase kind of comes out of nowhere. And what does it mean? And people have written talks and books about trying to interpret it. If you're familiar with Jonathan Edwards, you know it was a shorthand for what Edwards said about that. Mm-hmm. And it, it's much more meaningful that way. And, and I've been documenting more and more examples of that in the Book of Mormon, which we don't have time to talk about now. <laughs> but, but the point is, the narrative of Joseph Smith as a young religious seeker who sought God is something we can all relate to. The narrative of Joseph Smith as a farm boy who had this amazing vision, none of us can relate to. And I think it makes a big difference for people, for young people particularly, to understand the Joseph Smith story. And it's the same with the narrative of this. Someone translating an ancient record given by divine means, but it was still an ancient record of real people, is a completely different narrative than some story that appeared on a stone. Or just popped into his head. And that stone in the hat feeds the narrative that the Book of Mormon is fictional, too. And that, that's a whole other topic, but that, that's one of the reasons it matters. So okay. to just pick up here, so and this is something that, um, you know, our book, we've been mostly talking about the issue of 
Sir Stone versus uh, Yerman Thummim. Right. But that's really only the first p- part of our book is rebutting the, or let's put it this way, because um, as Jonathan said, you know, we're, what we're really looking for is balance. I mean, we quote at length, we quote all of the last testimony of Sister, of, uh, Sister Emma, we, we quote uh, at length all of the um, David Whitmer and so forth. We put all the sources in our book, um, as well as Joseph and Oliver, which other people omit from their book. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we acknowledge, you know, Joseph, David Whitmer did publish an address to all believers in Christ. You know, the last testimony of Sister Emma was published, uh, you know, in 1879. And so we're not saying that the sources don't exist. And we're not saying that these people were liars either. But what we are saying is that we need to do context and put them all in the larger context of where they came from. And we need to have all of the sources covered that are, you know, are reputable. And if you're you know, not going to say Joseph and Oliver are, just, are reputable, then, you know, okay, you know, you, you can go, you know, you can leave the church then. That's because that's what it's all based on. But the, 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 I mean, just to emphasize what Jonathan's saying, that's like the first part of the book. The whole second part of the book is uh, our exploring what translation means. How was it translated? I, you know, I kind of summarized the process. We, you know, we kind of elaborate that, looking at uh, uh, Bible translation scholarship and the leading Bible translation scholar of the last century, who's uh, Reverend uh, Eugene Nida. Um, and, uh, and we go through the narrative that jo- uh, Jonathan just mentioned of studying, you know, does Joseph Smith, if he actually was an actively engaged translator, which is the loose translation, you know, essential to the loose translation mm-hmm. theory, you know, does he make sense? You know, if he's a dumb kid who couldn't even write a letter, does he make any, does that make sense as to say that he was a, a translator? So we make the argument at length with sources that, in fact, as he's the kind of person Jonathan was describing, and we think that's important that he was a young religious seeker, uh, because uh, I think that's something that people can relate to today. The way I put it is that um, Joseph was a kid with a shelf. Joseph had a shelf. He had a shelf that was about Christianity rather than Mormonism, but he had issues. He had issues that bug- bugged him a lot. That's why he uh, you know, went to the Grove to pray, because he had a shelf. He had a bunch of issues that were really bugging him. Alvin. He- he came, well, Alvin, he came from a family. Grandpa Asael was a universalist. Right. Uncle Jesse was a hardcore Calvinist. How, you know, how, you know, how different can you get in inside his own family? There's right. the tumult of opinions and so forth that, that was in his outside environment as well. So we think that this portrait, uh, which kind of, you know, leaves behind the whole Searstone, Yerman Thummim issue, but this portrait of Joseph as a young religious seeker is a person, uh, the way I like to put it is that God chose a religious seeker to be the first prophet of the uh, dispensation of the fullness of times. What does that tell you that God chose a religious seeker to be the first prophet? It, and Joseph was very much a religious seeker. We think that's a Joseph that people today can relate to. Uh, much more so either than Joseph the, the smarmy folk mu- magician that the critics make out or this kind of diffuse Joseph that we get now from the church, you know, was the he farm boy. the ignorant farm boy or, or who knows the really slave. who he was, you know, or, or, or so forth. So, we, we, you know, we have like a whole narrative. This, this leads to a whole narrative of who Joseph was and what he was doing. Uh, when he was, you know, reestablishing the gospel, which, you know, we hope is something that, uh, you know, people can relate to. Uh, You know, at the end of the book, we say, uh, so we have this interpretation of the Yerman Thummim in terms of technology. So that we won't go into detail about that, but, you know, we see it as a a technology. Mm -hmm. We we say, don't think of the Yerman Thummim in terms of uh, it being... uh, magic, seer stones, folk magic stuff. It's technology. We should understand it in ter- our terms today 
it, you, you look at the description of what the Yerman Thummim did, and it sounds like technology. Yeah. So we say it's technology. And then we say, look at Joseph Smith. Who was he? He had this near-death experience. He was intellectually curious. He had questions. He read the Bible extensively. He was exposed to all of this stuff out of his environment, uh, which Jonathan Edwards was a big part of. And so he, and he became a religious seeker. So, you know, he was a nerd. Joseph Smith was a nerd. So that's our, <laughs> that's our reframing of Joseph Smith and the that's translation of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith was a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> we'll defend that. Yeah. We'll defend that. That's what we defend in the book, is this a new way of looking at Joseph and the origins of the, uh, of the church. So it's, it's, it's uh, I'd, I guess I'd, I'd just like to emphasize, it's, it's we, we feel that we grapple honestly and completely with the, Urim and Thummim versus the Searstone issue. But that's just the beginning of what this book talks about. And we, we, we think It's a that good thing we didn't discuss the whole book. We'd that's for <laughs> sure. That's for sure. And yet, it's only 208 pages, and that includes lots of footnotes at the bottom yeah. of the page, so it's not a long read. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jonathan Neville and Jim Lucas, co-authors of By Means and of the Urim and Thummim. Our next conversation with them will be our last, and it's only going to be available to newsletter subscribers. So subscribe to our free newsletter at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter, and I'll send you a link where they're going to critique the Gospel Topics essays. And the Gospel Topics essay are very poor on this. Uh, of course, they're limited in length, so you know, obviously that was uh, a difficulty too, but you know they... They are very poor on giving context. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on YouTube.com slash GospelTangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom and you can ask me anything you want. So Thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.